I've given you a handout which has a summary of the theology of the Quran. It's just a snapshot, an overview of the whole work. And I wrote that based on reading the Quran again and again. You know, that's my summary of what I believe the Quran's basic message is. And as you read it, you might think, well, how is this different or similar to a Christian theology of the nature of the world? So, um, uh, Allah the Creator has created human beings to serve him as slaves. The purpose of life is determined by the path they take. Those who are obedient to their Creator and attending to his signs, obeying his commands, are on the straight path, and those that don't are off that path. They're on the wrong path. Um, if people look to help for anybody but Allah, they're an associator. Human beings, this is quite critical, human beings by nature are ignorant and they're easily led astray. So that's the Islamic view of human character. Not that human beings are sinful. The, the biggest problem of, for humanity according to the Christian faith is sin. It's a kind of rebellion against God. Okay, But the Islamic view is not that human beings are born sinful or that they're sinful by nature, but they're rather ignorant and easily led astray. It's a very, it's a different understanding of human nature. They turn to Allah in need, but then they turn away when things go well. So Allah sends messengers um, who guide people to keep on the path. So the function of a messenger is to help people who are basically easily led astray to stay on the right path and to help them to pay attention to the signs that Allah provides to people to help them be on the right path. People can protect themselves by following the guidance brought by a messenger. And when they receive this guidance, they should turn back to Allah's way. Then Allah will be merciful for them. Otherwise, they'll be punished in this life and the next. And particularly, the messenger has now come. This capital M messenger is the one in the Quran. And like the previous messengers, he has a book from Allah. And true believers will do certain things. They'll, they'll pray daily. They'll give alms. And they'll offer service of Allah by following the teaching of the messenger. Then on Judgment Day, all people will be raised. It'll be too late to repent. Those that have heeded the messenger or previous messengers will be counted amongst the believers. They'll be successful and they'll enter the garden. But people who've rejected the truth and said that the messenger's um, signs are lies, they are disbelievers and they will suffer punishment not only in this life but the fire in the next life. So that's a, basic, that's a basic outline of what Islam teaches. It's a different anthropology, so it's a different belief in hum the issue with humanity. And we'll see that later. We'll look at the Adam and Eve story. And it's, it's, it's a story about ignorance and misguidance. It's not a story about sin. So um, that's just a very profoundly different view. If you go into a mosque and they give you pamphlets, it'll be all about guidance, being rightly guided, finding guidance. And... I sometimes say in Christianity the problem is sin, the solution is forgiveness, and the result is what we call salvation. In Islam the problem is ignorance and being easily led astray, the solution is guidance, and the result of being rightly guided is success in this life and the next. So it's a different, different understanding of the nature of life. This different understanding affects everything. It affects politics, economics, society. It's a very different view of human nature. I mean, one of the problems, for example, in, in Iran is that when they had an Iranian revolution, a religious revolution, the country was being run by religious scholars. They were, they were being guided by the Quran and the Sunnah and, and Islam, but they were corrupt people. And, and they imposed corruption on society. So they were unable to make people good. So that, that would be my Christian critique of the Iranian revolution. Because it denies the reality of sin. Okay, let's. I want to talk about Allah. The um, the the term Allah um, is actually a contraction. Maybe a bit closer. Al is the, and Ilah means God, and this is contracted to Allah. So originally in Arabic means the God. It's widely used in pagan inscriptions before Islam. It's actually related, this il, ilah, is, is related to Hebrew, Eloah, or also in Elohim. It's a Semitic, it's a basically very old Semitic word for God, or gods in general. 
Um, it's not clear that Allah was one specific deity in, in, in pagan Arab, Arab life, but there are some, some goddesses called the daughters of Allah that are referred to in the Quran. So maybe Allah, there was a one god who was called Allah as well, I'm not sure. And there's some evidence that Christians used both Al-Ilah or Allah to refer to God before the Quran, a Christian Arabs. But were they, was it actually the name of God in Arabic, or was it just, they were just saying the God about their own God? It's not quite clear. Um, it's interesting, I just want to say a few more comments about this. The Syria, a lot of influence from Syriac Christianity on the, on the Quran, and um, Syriac word for God is Allah, and in West Syria it's Allah, um, and it's interesting that the way this is pronounced in Arabic, the L is darkened, and it's people say a lot, which, is, which, which has the effect of changing the colour of this vowel as well. It's the only L in Arabic that stands by itself that has that dark pronunciation. It's a puzzle. And some scholars have suggested that it was actually copied from the O oh sound in West Syriac. So the Syriac speakers, the Christian Syriac speakers used to say Allah, so... So uh, early Muslims called their God Allah. But they used an old Arabic term, but they made it sound a bit like a Syriac word. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting history. Christian Arabs today just call God Allah as well. So this is the term just for God in terms of... But it's the distinctive Islamic kind of personal name for God too. Now, um, sometimes you'll read people say that um, Allah was a moon god. That's just complete nonsense. Okay, it's just... It's not true. Okay. I think what I said is accurate. <laughs> um, Allah is the creator. He sustains all things by his will. The whole earth is sustained by the will of Allah. The sun, the moon and the stars move at his command. Seeds germinate and come alive by his, by his hand. A very important doctrine of um, Islam is the doctrine of oneness, Tawheed. It means oneness or uniqueness. And it's based on four Arabic cultural constructs. So you can imagine pagan Arab society. There's certain values that are built into the society. And this idea of God as the one only God, one only God is constructed, but it's constructed based on four cultural characteristics that are, that are already part of the society. So... Um, one is the idea of financial partnership, which is uh, Arabic, like, like Hebrew, is, is most words have three consonants in them. So the idea of shirk, uh, the noun is shirk, which means partnership or association. This is the idea when, um, when two people own something together, like you own a house together, you're, you're in association or partnership, okay? And... Um, Islam teaches that Allah associates or has partnership with nobody. In fact, the Quran says that attributing shirk to Allah, to say that Allah has a partner, is the only unforgivable sin. So that's saying that God has a son is such, is such an example of that. So this is a, const a construct from Arab culture, partnership, financial partnership, two men owning a slave together, for example, um, then it gets a, it, it becomes theological. So uh, Allah has no partners. That's the first one. Um, surely the Quran says, surely Allah does not forgive anything being associated with Him. That is anything being put into partnership with Him, but He forgives what is other than that for whoever He pleases. He forgives anything He likes, but He doesn't forgive associating anything with Him. Um, the Quran says disaster would result if there was association because you'd have two different gods and they'd both claim ownership over people as their slaves. And it says there's nothing more miserable than a slave having two masters. That's true. I don't know if you've ever been enslaved by two different people, but I imagine it would be very difficult. So um, this is, it's actually taking a, a story out of, out, of Arab contemporary, out of the culture of the time and projecting it onto God. Um, Allah has no daughters. Another important um, relationship is the wali relationship, the, the, the idea of a patron. 
patronage relationship. In Arab uh, tribal societies, um, patronage was really important. You lived or died, declaring on who was your patron and who you were a protege under. It's very clear in the life of Muhammad as well. So, um, and the, the Quran teaches that you should have no patron but Allah. And he needs no, this can also mean a business partner as well. It can be, be reciprocal, having a partner, or it can mean having a patron. So Allah has no allies. It also can mean an ally. So Allah has no allies, he has no patron, he needs no partners. So that's another aspect of the unity of God. The third one is the idea of helping relationships. Uh, the term Ansar, these are the helpers who helped Muhammad in, um, sorry, in, uh, start again. They helped Muhammad in Medina. Um, only Allah can be anyone's helper. The only helper is Allah. Then Allah has no helpers. So uh, all power, patronage, part, you know, comes from Allah, and Allah has no associators. So has no, no, no one has associated with him. And the fourth uh, concept is that of equal and unequal status. Some things are equal, some things are unequal, but nothing is equal with God. So the, idea, uh, the ideas uh, around Tawheed, about the unity of God that you'll find in the Quran, are all elaborations of these four basic concepts. Allah has no associators. He has no patrons. We have no patron but Allah. He has no allies. Allah is our only ally, and nothing is equal to God. Now, that whole complex of ideas, which you'll see again and again, and look, from an English-speaking person's point of view, these seem quite alien concepts. I mean, tribal patronage is not a big part of my daily life, you know. I'm not wandering around Melbourne wondering who my patron is, you know. But it, it might be important in other cultures, but these seem quite strange ways of thinking. But this is how the Quran constructs the unity of God. This is not actually based on a biblical covenantal understanding of God. It's not actually based upon a polemic against idols, which you see in the Old Testament. It's actually based upon these basic characteristics. It's interesting, the word, for, the word that's often translated in the, in the Quran as polytheist is actually based on this first term, mushrik. The word the Quran uses for, um, for the pagan Arabs is associator. These associate others with Allah. They say he has partners, but he doesn't. So these are lying people who have a false view of Allah. They're blaspheming him by saying he has associators, that he has associates. Um, so that's that. Um, attributes of Allah. He's the creator. He knows all things. That's very important. Where the Quran says that Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein, the, the Quran goes on to explain that means he knows everything you do. He sees everything. He's compassionate if you turn to him. He punishes wickedness. He's sovereign. He is sovereign over all things. Nothing affects us, smites us, hurts us, except what Allah has prescribed for us. If there's an earthquake, if there's a disaster, if there's blessing, it all comes from Allah. No one dies except by the permission of Allah. The time of someone's death is determined by Allah. He makes promises and imposes obligations on people, but I would say there isn't a true understanding of covenant in the Quran. A reciprocal obligation is not part of the way Allah works. There's quite a lot of anthropomorphic language, so the Quran says that he's alive, that he hears, he knows, he has a face, hands, eyes, moves in space, sits on a throne, he has emotions like anger, pleasure and love. But despite this, the general trend of Islamic theology is being to deny all these terms as being anything like human characteristics. Because if you say that he has attributes that are like human attributes, you're actually associating him with people. You're saying he's like people. And that's unacceptable. So the way Muslim scholars deal with that is they say, when it say Allah loves, it's nothing like human love. And when he has... Um, he knows it's nothing like human knowledge. These are just terms that actually mean something completely different from God. So that's interesting. But the things that are really missing in the character of God are really interesting. Um, God is not, Allah is not described as faithful in the Quran. And there isn't an understanding of covenant in the Quran. There's command, but no covenant. 
He's not described as good. He's described as bringing good, like harvest and rain and so on. He, he blesses people, but he himself is not described as being good. There's not a single verse in the Quran that says Allah is good. The Quran also d- doesn't describe God as being present. This is an incredibly important attribute of God in the Bible. He's walking in the. Tell a Muslim that, that God was walking in the Garden of Eden with Adam. He used to go for a walk in the cool of the evening. They'll just say, oh, that's ridiculous. You know? Because Islam knows that Allah cannot be situated. One, one scholar said, Islam dwe- Allah dwells in nothing and nothing dwells in him. He doesn't participate personally in the world. He's never present. He's never present in the way, you know, in the Bible, you've got God goes before the people um, in the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. The glory of the Lord is between the wings of the cherubim. David says, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Jesus is the presence of God. God with us, Emmanuel. We have the Holy Spirit. God with us. It is God walking in the Garden of Eden. We see Moses debating with God. Don't send an angel, God. You have to come personally with us, so we will not go. I'm not going anywhere without your personal presence. All of that stuff makes absolutely no sense from a Quranic understanding of God. Because the idea of God being personally present is very alien to the Quran's understanding of God. Another thing that's really missing in the Quran is holiness. The, the God does, is called holy twice, using a word borrowed from Syriac. But there's a reason why it's not a major attribute of God. And it has to do with pagan Arab religion. In, in the time before Islam came, the concept of sacredness in the pagan Arab religions, and I had places called sanctuaries, but the concept of sacredness was based on the idea of forbiddenness. You know the area in Mecca where the, where the Kaaba is, where people gather? Do you know what, that, what that's called? It's called the Haram, which means the forbidden place, the sanctuary. So the Haram, or this idea of the root is H-R-M, this, sorry, this idea of being forbidden was the term, the concept of sacredness that applied amongst the Arabs. So a sanctuary was a forbidden place that you could only go to at certain times. And sacred months were months in which certain things were forbidden for people to do. And you can't say God is forbidden. It doesn't make any sense. So you can't speak of a sacred God. So sacredness in the Arab pagan understanding was a a very much a temporal characteristic of being separated from, you know, people not being allowed to go there. So there wasn't actually a spirituality of holiness that applied to God. And the Hebrew term for holy is based on a a verb that means to move away, to be separate, separated from. So the idea of holiness in the Bible is God is separate from us. He is apart. He draws apart. A sanctuary is holy because it's a separate place. Now that root, to move away, exists in classical Arabic. So you can move away from but it's not the root that's used for holiness in Arab pagan religion. It applied in Syriac and in Hebrew, but not in Arabic. So what happens is Arabic borrows words from Hebrew based on that root, but it doesn't comprehend them, it doesn't understand them, and they're not integrated into the spirituality. So it's actually a really interesting question to ask a Muslim, is God holy and why? What does that mean to you? And when you read the commentaries on the two verses that call God holy in the Quran, the commentators actually don't know what it means, and they'll give lots of suggestions. Purity is about the closest they can get to it. But Islam doesn't have a concept of the holiness of God, doesn't have a concept of the goodness of God, apart from the fact that he can be benevolent. The presence of God is missing, and he's not faithful. These are really important attributes for salvation. They're very important for covenantal theology. You can't explain the incarnation without these attributes. If someone doesn't know God can be present, that he's faithful, that he's loving towards his enemies, that he's good, that he makes himself present and so on, that he's holy, you can't explain Jesus. And the Trinity doesn't make any sense without these attributes. So um, that's just a, it's an interesting thing. Just um, a small, small question. Yes. Uh, we've heard several times that the Quran doesn't describe God as being loving. Is that, is that true? Or? It does. It, God loves those who serve him and submit to him, but he, he doesn't love those that don't. The Quran says that many times. 
So that that is based on performance. If you it's 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 being on the right path, yeah, and. And it's interesting, it says that he doesn't love more than he loves, you know. The emphasis is, 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 if anything, on the not loving rather than the loving. And it never says that he loves enemies, or he loves those who oppose him at all. That's inconceivable. And in a sense, the God, you could say the God of the Quran is not relational in that sense. He's relational in the sense that a master is relational to a slave. Which is he's a good he's a good master perhaps to those who are obedient to him. Human beings, let's talk about that. There are a few different sentient beings in the Quran. There's the jinn, genies as we have in the traditional stories. The jinn can be um, uh, they can be good and bad. You have Muslim jinn and non-Muslim jinn, so they're just like human beings. In fact, the Quran speaks of some jinn that heard the Quran being recited and became Muslims. Then you have um, Satan, al Shaitan, who's also called Iblis, is like a particular evil figure. And there are there are other there are spirits, apparently jinn, that are called Satans. So in the Quran you speak of Satan, the biggest Satan, but also little little Satans as well. So these could be <coughs> evil spirits of some kind. And there are also angels who are really important. In fact, belief in angels is considered to be one of the key kind of beliefs of Islam. Um, it's through the angels that the, the books are revealed as well. The fundamental metaphor, I think, for human relationship with God is that of a servant to a master. Um, there are lots of commands in the Quran to serve, serve Allah. And like a master, uh, Allah has complete discretion over his slaves. He can do what he likes with them. Human beings, as I said, are inherently weak. The human was created weak, the Quran says, chapter 4, verse 28. Human beings are hasty. They rush into things. They don't take time to work out what's right and wrong. They're easily deceived by creature comforts by the pleasures of human existence, by women, by sons, by gold, by silver, by horses and cattle. They all lead people away from the right path. And they are by nature ignorant. Humans are by nature ungrateful and stubborn in the way they reject God. They call for help when they need help from God, but afterwards they ignore or forget God. They're fickle. And they're also bound down by the old ways of their cultures, the ways of their ancestors. There's a lot of hostility in the Quran to cultural traditions from the past that have to be changed. Guidance is the fundamental metaphor for uh, what you might call um, rescue. You know, it's, it's, it's what God does to solve the problem of humanity's fickleness. Guide us on the straight path. The prayer that every Muslim prays, I think, 17 times a day, as part of their daily prayers that are done five times a day, is guide us on the straight path, the path of those you've blessed, not the path of those on whom your anger falls or those who've gone astray. So the fundamental prayer of the Muslim is to be on the right path. That's, that's the idea of the straight path. Allah guides whoever he pleases to the straight path, the Quran says. So the fundamental human choice is the straight path of Islam or the crooked path of everything else. It's Allah who determines what is the right path. And Allah is the one who sets the direction. I wonder if you could turn to that sheet that you've got and just turn over from the summary I gave of Islamic, um, Islamic theology. And I'm looking at the first, the Adam story. I've given you two Adam stories here. So this is the story of the fall. And just to, to, to recap, in the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve is one of a series of falls of stories in the in Genesis that speak about the sinfulness of human beings. Um, and it, it gets to a certain point where it says the whole inclination of human beings' heart was towards sin. You know, and then you have the, the story of Noah, and, and it's it's a kind of a, a series of catastrophes that, that, that mount up. But have a look at what the story says. So this is from the second chapter. And we said, Adam, so Allah, we is God speaking. God says, Adam, inhabit the garden, you and your wife, and eat freely of whatever you please, but don't go near this tree, or you'll both be among the evildoers. Then al Shaitan caused them both to slip from there and to go out from where they were. And we said, so Allah said, go down, some of you as an enemy to others. 
the earth is a dwelling place for you and enjoyment of life for a time. Then Adam received certain words from his Lord and he turned to him. So God turns to Adam in forgiveness. Surely Allah is the one who, who turns to forgiveness. He's compassionate. We said, Allah says, go down from it, all of you. If any guidance comes to you from me, whoever follows my guidance, there will be no fear on him, nor will they sorrow. What are some of the differences in this story from the biblical story? Can I ask a question? What, yeah. what does it mean, go down? I go down from paradise. So paradise, the garden is thought of as being in a higher place, and so they're going out of the garden. Not in a different dimension? No, I don't think so. I think you're going down to the earth. If you think of this as a little sermon, and the explanation of the sermon is the last line, which a lot of the Quran is like that, what is what is the Quran says is the interpretation of this story. You need guidance. You need guidance, and if you get guidance, you should follow it. So Allah gave them a guidance not to eat of the tree, but Satan deceived them and, and misguided them. So their error was to be misguided. And it's a story about guidance. But there are other things that are different as well. They slipped. They slipped. They slipped. They slipped. They never fell. It's interesting. They, it's like they're going off the path. So they're on a, the right path, but they slip off the path. They kind of lose their footing and wander off. There's no curses of the fall here. There's actually, God blesses the earth for them to live in. And, and, and Adam becomes like a godly man. He gets forgiven by God and he's actually listed amongst the prophets by many Muslims. So there's not much emphasis on the sin and the consequences of sin here. It's an example of, of, of staying on the right path. Allah is, is, is forgiving to those who stay on his path. And what's interesting here is that he extends forgiveness to Adam and Eve when sending them out of the garden. We're not ex we're not, it's not explained to us what Adam and Eve did that was right or, or earned his favour. This is just a, a kindness of God to him and we don't know why. Yeah. Maybe my question would be more specific. On what basis are these brackets included? So is this theology? This is the translator. The, the, the word turn in Arabic is very um, brief. It, and um, and it's not. It would be ambiguous. So that the interpreter is adding that they would have read the commentaries. So it says Allah turned to Adam. So that's being explained. Meaning he had mercy on him. That's that's the royal plural, the plural of divinity. Like Elohim is plural for God in the Bible, and so it's God is speaking in the plural. It's like the Queen. We are not amused. Um, have a look at the next version. This is, there's several versions of the story in the Quran. And we said, Adam, surely this is an enemy to you and to your wife. So God is speaking about Satan. Don't let him expel you both from the garden and you become miserable. Surely it's, it's yours not to hunger and thirst there or go naked, nor to thirst there or be exposed to the sun. But al -shaitan, Satan whispered to him and said, Adam, shall I direct you to the tree of immortality and to a kingdom that doesn't decay? So they both ate from it, and their shameful parts became apparent to them, and they both began fastening on themselves some leaves from the garden, and Adam disobeyed his Lord and erred. Then his Lord chose him and turned to him in forgiveness and guided him. And he said, Go down from it, both of you together, some of you an enemy to others. If any guidance comes to you from me, whoever follows my guidance will not go astray nor become miserable, but whoever turns away from my reminder... Surely for him there'll be a life of deprivation and we shall gather him blind on the day of resurrection. So notice the emphasis on guidance as well. And notice also in this story that Allah um, is compassionate towards them and then rightly guides them. They, they sort of get restored to guidance in some way that's not quite fully explained. Notice also that the, the Quran says that they're not naked in the garden. Remember, in the, in the Bible, they're naked, but they don't see anything shameful. They don't know shame. But this is incomprehensible to the author of this text. So he actually, God has them were clothed in the garden. And somehow they sin in a way which reveals their nakedness. It's like they take their clothes off. And that's their sin. But this, this is slotted into a whole set of assumptions. Whoever 
how did someone hear this story? They must have heard it in a sermon or a sn snippet in the marketplace, and it's been misunderstood. It's been fitted into a new theological framework, and it's making a very different point from the original point. It looks similar, but the more you look at it, it's quite an alien text. Can you explain that this goes down, some of you, as enemies? So in the understanding, Adam and Eve would leave and in that sense go down, and then their descendants would include some enemies. Yeah, there'll be, in future, human beings will be in conflict with each other. And that's a theme of the Quran, that people are pitted against each other, particularly those who are on the right path and those who aren't. So there's a bit of a trace of a curse there, isn't there? Um, and the you know, Satan sends Eve. So there's yeah. no kind of mention of Eve. Yeah, Eve doesn't figure. Yeah. Yeah, there's no messengers who are ever women. Right. The women don't don't figure much. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus. She she gets a good rap, but there's not a lot mm -hmm. apart from that. The role of Satan is really interesting, actually, because in another text, the, the Satan says to God, "You made me evil." And Satan says, well, I will wait along the path and try and mislead people. And Allah said, okay, off you go. So there's an interesting question, where does evil come from too? But the differences are quite profound and, and fascinating to think about. Another question. This is part of the very long Christian tradition, which says that Muhammad was a cobbler. That is that he, as, as one person referred to it, that is he took stuff from Christians and Jews, perhaps from non-Orthodox Christians and Jews, and the reason why there's things that are a bit different in the Quran is they took it from, from sources that weren't pure. You know? So this is a very, very old idea. And, and there's an idea that he was once a Christian, or he was once a Jew, or he used to do this. But all of that, the stories on which that's based were written hundreds of years after Muhammad, first thing. Um, second is, um, some of the, the details are not right. Like, the, the word Jerusalem is not mentioned anywhere in the Hadiths or the Quran. There is no reference to Jerusalem anywhere. It doesn't say that he prayed to Jerusalem. It said he used to pray towards Sham, which means Syria. And, you know, we impose a kind of grid on this that's actually not there in the original text. And my reading and understanding of all this material is that, 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 you know, when Islam came, it was shocking. And so one of the responses to that is to say, oh, this is corrupted Christianity. This is kind of distorted Judaism or whatever. I don't think that does justice to the original source and the creativity of it. Someone has done a great PhD tracking the Syriac writings of that time about Adam and Eve and connecting them to this story. So they, people have done that work looking at those stories. But it doesn't explain the theological shift in the story, the shift away from a biblical worldview of sin towards a worldview of guidance. And what the Quran is doing is, I don't think this is just someone who poorly understands Christianity. This is someone with their own theology imposing it on things they've heard. And the second thing I'd say is that to say that he had years of exposure to Judaism and Christianity is totally inconsistent with the problems in the Quran. For example, not knowing that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was, was not the sister of Moses. Um, the, there is very strong evidence that whoever put the Quran together did not have sustained uh, formation in a Christian or a Jewish tradition, but they were exposed to lots of material which they incorporated into their own worldview. I'm going to come to, back to that later, but the view you put to me is just a classic, very, very old view. I don't think it fits the data. It's tempting. If you meet you know, Nestorian Christians, they'll tell you it was a Nestorian monk who influenced him. If you meet Iranians, they'll tell you it was a Zoroastrian. If you meet, you know, Jews, they'll tell you they got it from a Jew. But, but, but all those stories are written much later, and you really have to look at what the Quran actually says and how it relates to the text. We're going to stop for morning tea now.